Good morning. Our call to worship this morning, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Certain songs you only sing at certain times. Certain PowerPoints are giving me fits this morning. So. Here we go. Come, you thankful people, come. But it's not showing online. I'm sorry, give me just one minute. Because this is going to give me fits. All right, let's stand together. Come, you thankful people, come if you'd like the uh, music. It's 493 in your book. Come, you thankful people, come. Sing out for me, for the Lord. Make help. Come, you thankful people, come. morning is the first nine verses of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, if you'd follow as I read verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I, incur and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. 
but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Thank the Lord for his word this morning. Let's sing together again, number 495, if you like, 495, count your blessings. Count my spells, you are tempest-tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings. Turn to number 26 and bring it on up.
children are dismissed to junior church at this time. My title this morning is Thanksgiving Baskets. Thanksgiving Baskets. I have a subtitle. I'll give it to you later. Uh, every year, our folks, and especially our pilgrim kids attendees, bring in food for Thanksgiving baskets. Our deacons divide up this food. They buy turkeys with money that was given for that purpose, and they pass it out to folks that can use it. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a fulfillment of the principles of Acts chapter 4, folks that were able to help, help folks that needed some help. And uh, it's a beautiful thing, and uh, we delight in it every year. But, you know, we don't actually put any of it in baskets. This year, you know, everybody has those reusable shopping bags, and we had a number of those around church, so that worked out pretty slick. That was actually probably the best thing we've done. Usually it's in boxes. Maybe once in a while there's a wicker basket that comes and goes uh, for that purpose, but we don't actually put it in baskets. Uh, baskets are really quite something. Uh, they've been around since almost as long as man's been around. People have been weaving baskets in every culture for every conceivable purpose and in every conceivable size. Uh, there's a passage in the New Testament that talks about the the measure that you measure out with, it's going to be measured back to you. And uh, I've always thought in my mind, if, if I said I give you a basket full of corn for such and such a price, well, which basket would it be? Uh, my first teaching job was in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, Kim was selling Longaburger baskets. Some of you know about Longaburger baskets, and a very well-made basket, and they made baskets of all sizes. If I was going to sell you corn in, in what was called the key basket, the key basket was about that big. wasn't much to it at all. So if I charge you a dollar for a key basket full of corn, I'd be ripping you off if all I charged was a dollar. Uh, but they also, we went to the Longer Burger plant mill and uh, visited it, and the public restrooms are a basket. The whole building is a basket with a very large men's room and a very large ladies' room. And it's an actual woven maple wood strip basket. So baskets can be made any size, and they can be really made to any purpose. There's hampers and there's laundry baskets that are made out of wood or of wicker. And they hold up wonderfully, and, and a, a well-made basket is an heirloom that gets passed down. And um, there's some wonderful craftsmanship through the years in baskets. Uh, the interwoven wood or wicker strips provide remarkable strength in a lightweight package. May I suggest that strips of thanksgiving, that is of thankfulness, interwoven in the life of a believer provide a remarkable package as well. A package significantly stronger than any of its individual parts, just like a basket. A thin strip of, of maple, maybe a 32nd or a 16th of an inch thick. Um, I'm sorry, Bob, I don't know the decimal or I give it to you. Uh, but a thin strip of maple woven together, you know, if it stands by itself, it's this little floppy piece of wood. It's not worth much. But in the hands of somebody that knows what they're doing, whether on the floor of Longer Burger or whether a Native American Indian way back in the year, years ago on the Pacific Coast, in the hands of skill, a skilled person weaving them together, there becomes remarkable strength in a basket. Scripture talks about a cord of three strands in Ecclesiastes, talking about having someone else to help you. Two working together is better than one. If one falls down, there's nobody there to pick him up. And if one lays down, he's cold. If two lay down, they're warm, and on and on it goes. Two is better than one. And when it comes to self-defense, 
You know, two is better than one. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And uh, we've seen at some weddings in recent memory where people have three strands. They have the husband's strand, the wife's strand, and then God. And that cord of three strands is woven together as a picture. The cord of three strands is not easily broken. I, I'm going to basically, I'm maybe stretching my picture a little bit here, but thankfulness, thanksgiving, and our passage in, in, uh, in Philippians where he says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I was always confused by that. Because when I was a kid, Thanksgiving was the last Thursday of November. That's what Thanksgiving was. I never thought of it as anything but a holiday. Uh, maybe you've been there too. I hope I'm not the only one that was that foolish. Uh, but Thanksgiving is giving thanks. It's gratitude. It's gratefulness. It's thankfulness. And there are so many aspects where Thanksgiving, if it's woven together... There are many strands of thanksgiving that will make us the strong Christians we ought to be and put us in a position where actually we can more readily expect God's blessing in the first place. Let's have a word of prayer and then talk about some of these strands. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this time of year. Uh, we are reminded, Lord, that the, the origin story of thanksgiving goes back to the pilgrims in our fair state uh, 400 years ago plus. But Lord, we know it wasn't a national holiday until the Civil War tore our country apart and made a shambles of it. And it was in the midst of that that we established this holiday. The truth is there, there is no Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, or Elf trying to horn in on Thanksgiving. In a sense, Thanksgiving is our most Christian holiday and uh, it's, it's, it's at its purest. And Lord, the Christian life really ought to be a life of thankfulness. May we give thanks, not only this time of year, not only in the good times, but may we obey you and give you thanks in everything, even when it's not easy. But Lord, we can do that only because we trust you. May we trust you even more. Bless our time as we look at your word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I have a lot of scripture. Hang with me. Almost every bit of it is on PowerPoint. Uh, that way, if you can't hear my frog, you can read it for yourself, and uh, it'll help get it into us. Uh, but thanks, thanksgiving, gratitude weaves all through Scripture in several different ways, and in several different respects it weaves through Scripture. Uh, we can think of the thanksgiving strand of man's spiritual consciousness. The first strand is the strand of man's spiritual consciousness, the thanksgiving strand of that spiritual awareness. In Romans 1, 18 through 21, man who could see God in his person and in creation was willfully forgetful and not thankful. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. God's wrath is revealed. The first three chapters of Romans is really about telling us where we stand before God apart from Christ. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Chapter 1, the savage, if you will. The savage in the bush. He does not know how to read. His language may not even be written down. He has no Bible in his hand. He can see God in nature. He can see what God has done for him in nature and be thankful for it. He refuses to recognize God and he worships the nature instead. And so it may not be enough to take him clear to the cross and to the gospel and salvation but it's enough to condemn because he could see God in creation and he refuses to see God in creation. 
one of my very favorite stories. I don't know the ins and outs of it. It was told to me as a true story. It was in a South Pacific island, and they worshipped a, a tiki, a, a wooden idol. There was a young man, he was the son of an idol maker, the grandson, the great-grandson of an idol maker. He inherit, was going to inherit the family business, same as everybody else. It was a very good job and something sacred in his village to carve this wooden tiki. They had a sample, <coughs> excuse me, an ideal to work off of and to copy. And his job was to cut a certain kind of tree, to take a certain cut from that tree, and to carve it, to mold it, to shape it, to look like this little face of this tiki. And he was told in no uncertain terms that if he ever didn't make it right, if it didn't look like the last one, that he was going to be struck dead or some other horrible thing would befall him. But he began to have his doubts. After all, he thought, it's my hands making this. This is just an inanimate block of wood, and I am making it something special. And the more he looked at the tree, the more impressed he was, and the more he thought that something or someone probably planned that tree to have leaves that gathered light and moisture, to have roots that gathered moisture and nutrients from the ground. And so he was really thinking about this, and he decided to tempt fate, if you will. It's a terrible phrase. I don't know how else to put it. But uh, he, he disfigured a little more each time. Every time he made an idol, he made it a little different. One ear lower than the other considerably, a different shape to the eyes. By the time he was done, he had made an idol that looked nothing like the original, and nothing had happened to him, and he knew that that God that he was making was no God at all. And when a missionary came from another country and told the villagers about sin and salvation and Jesus and the cross, you know who was the first one to get saved? The idol maker's son. Because God had made him thoroughly frustrated with his system of worship and he had seen through it. Man could see it and didn't. And notice here, even in the midst of this, he was not thankful. They knew God, they did not honor him as God, and they did not give him thanks. Presumptuousness, being spoiled, not being thankful. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Hey, what do you think? Is this true? Think we're looking at it? Boy, I hope it doesn't get a whole lot worse than this, but it's probably going <coughs> to. Sorry. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. This description of mankind in the last days is bleak, it's dark, it's ugly. They, people are going to love themselves, they're going to love the almighty dollar, they're going to be proud and arrogant. They're going to speak horribly against a good thing, a reviler. They're going to disobey their parents. What do you think about the breakdown of the American home? Think we're looking at it? I think it's been breaking down for longer than I've been alive, but I think it's really, really picking up speed on this side of the hill. And the wedges that are being put between parent and child by society, by the education system, by the media in its every form, it's grievous. And it's getting worse by the day. It is not what it used to be. It has gotten much, much worse. And in this list of all these horrible things that describe and define man in the last days and these terrible, perilous times that come, ungrateful shows up. One of the things that marks the fallen man in the last day is he's not thankful. He's not thankful for anything. He's, the word we use today, entitled. And that's modern man in his sickest form. Luke chapter 17, the story of the ten lepers. Speaking of Jesus, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, 
he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men, who stood at a distance, met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go, your faith has made you whole. Leprosy, a horrible disease eating away, literally eating away at flesh of people. It quarantined them away from their family for probably the rest of their life until their heart stopped. Uh, they didn't get to live with family again. It was a horrible, awful thing. And just when you thought you couldn't take it anymore, it got worse. And here's ten men. And they cried out with a loud voice. I think we picture this a little bit more, a, a little better in the post-COVID world. I don't think they even got within six feet of the Lord, and that's why they had to raise their voice. Jesus, have mercy on us. And nine, all ten, go to show yourself to the priest. The leper who was cleansed, the leper who was healed, had to go and show himself, present himself before the priest and show that he was cleansed of the thing to be put back into society. That was the way it went. So they were not instantly healed. Jesus sent them to the priest as if they were healed, and as they were on their way, boom, they're healed. And nine men went about their life and went to whatever they had planned and whatever they wanted to do and couldn't. But one man, with a loud voice, praised the Lord and worshipped Jesus and thanked him profusely. And so pointedly, it was a Samaritan. This is one of the earliest glimpses into the gospel to the Gentile that we have. Jesus was glad for the Samaritan man to be healed, and he said his faith had made him whole. Um, so, several examples in the negative from Romans, 2 Timothy, and Luke. Our spiritual consciousness, if we are conscious of who God is, what he has done, and what he has done for us, we should necessarily be thankful. Our spiritual con uh, consciousness. Next, this Thanksgiving strand of man's spiritual sustenance. Man's spiritual sustenance is woven into this Thanksgiving basket. Ephesians 5, chapter 18. Spent some, quite a bit of time here with the men's Sunday school class. I refer to this passage often. We're going to refer to its close twin in Colossians uh, here as well. Uh, it even has more about thankfulness than Ephesians 5 does, uh, does Colossians 3. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 and verse 18 in the parentheses. That's a more literal translation. Uh, I didn't want to call it the NHV, the Nate Heyman version, but that's the gist. Uh, there's the only the only flexibility there is is in the voice It's either be filling yourself with spiritual things or it could be be being filled with spiritual things I think the sense of it is Don't be imbibing alcohol and giving up control Alcohol never made anything better uh, Don't be imbibing alcohol and giving away your control, but be filling yourself with spiritual things uh, computer programmers know what you put in is what you get out. Garbage in, garbage out. Well, the human computer is the greatest computer ever invented. God invented it. And it's very true there. Garbage in, garbage out. What do you fill yourself with? Fill yourself with spiritual things. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Our sustenance is on spiritual things, and even as we are taking in, absorbing spiritual things, we do that with a heart of thankfulness. And our response to everything. This is hard stuff. I mean, our prayer list, I was quite a while giving prayer requests this morning, and I left out more than I included. We have so many people going through so much right now, today, right here. 
We have so many folks that have been through some other people. We have people in our church, when we talk about their life situation, the name Job comes into the conversation. They've been through so much, and we never would have wished it on our friend. We wouldn't wish it on an enemy, uh, let alone a brother or sister in Christ. But we see what people go through, and yet we're encouraged, we're commanded to be thankful for everything. God is molding me, shaping me. As we said at uh, Pie and Praise, God is not done with me yet. And praise the Lord, He's not done with us yet. We can be thankful. That's the strand of spiritual sustenance. And then in the strand of man's spiritual conduct, the strand of man's spiritual conduct, Colossians chapter 3, uh, if you know me, you know that this is a favorite. Uh, if you've heard me talk about it, I think it's a veritable twin uh, to uh, Ephesians 5. You're going to find several phrases, several verses that are identical. Um, it's not quite a twin, but it's very, very close. Uh, some of you may have heard or, or met Carl or, and or Ken Elgina. Uh, Carl and Ken were twins. They went to twin, Twinsburg, Ohio every year to the big twin festival and they got to preach at a local church there every year to hundreds and hundreds of people who came, a lot of them looking alike. Had to be a lot of fun. They would tell you that they were mirror twins. They were not identical, truly, but one side of their face was identical. And so the old joke that one of them would tell, you know, Ken would say, what that means in real life is in the morning I'll be in my bathroom, I'll be shaving in front of the mirror, and I'll go to do the other side, and Carl, what are you doing in my, ba in my bathroom? You know? uh, but Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, I think they're mirror twins. They're not identical. Oh, they're close. They're really very close. Written at the same time, uh, these letters were to be exchanged. The Colossian church was to share their letter with the Ephesian church and vice versa, and so very near twins. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, <clears throat> to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let your state of being be thankfulness. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. You sang out this morning. It was beautiful. I did a lot more listening than I usually do because I couldn't do much uh, participating uh, like I normally would. Uh, but singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This passage is just dripping with the sense of thanksgiving and thankfulness all through and through it. Be thankful. Uh, you remember English class, your being verbs, am, as, are, was, were, be, being, been. It's your state of being. Be thankful. That's what you are to be. That is to describe you. That is where you exist is in thankfulness. Um, <clears throat> we sing the end of verse 16 with thankfulness. And, and one of my favorite old hymns after, or choruses, after all he's done for me, after all he's done for me, how can I do less than give him my best and live for him completely after all he's done for me? Our singing ought to bubble over with thankfulness, with thanksgiving. We truly are thankful, and so that ought to just pour out of us that we're grateful. Uh, you know how it is. We're, we're coming up on the Christmas season. Judy snuck carols in in the prelude this morning already. Uh, we're just about to Christmas. You've given your kids and your grands gifts, and you've given gifts when people were just thoroughly thankful and grateful, and you've given gifts that either it was the gift or it was the person or whatever the situation where it just kind of, eh. Who's easier to give to? Someone who's grateful or someone who's not? Isn't it so much easier to give to a grateful person? A grateful person, it, it really kind of keeps the circle going. Uh, one of our ladies likes to talk about, I, I'm not a pond or a lake, I'm a river. A blessing comes to me and it goes through me. I want to pass the blessing on to somebody else. What a wonderful, beautiful way to look at things, is it not? You know about the Dead Sea, right? Water flows in, but it doesn't flow out. And it just gathers and all those minerals, you can float on it easily. I'd, probably, I, I'd, I'd love to swim in it someday. I'd probably be a better swimmer uh, with all that buoyancy. Uh, but uh, 
we're not to be the Dead Sea, we're to be a river, uh, to let it go. And so the other side of that is, is we're thankful. Thankfulness lets the world go around. It lets God continue to bless and care. We need to continually be thankful and sing with our thankfulness. And then thankfulness shows up in what we do and how we do it. Do you think God enjoys baseball? I think he does. I really do. Pick your sport. Basketball, football, soccer. Um, you know, I, I think God enjoys watching people do what he made them capable of doing. And I think he likes it when people play their very best. Um, I've seen my dad on the field at a church softball game, and I've just had to shake my head. I watched him one time running. I think he was trying to score from first. Somebody had hit the ball in a gap. He was trying to score from first. He rounded third. He was about a third of the way from third to home, and he had kind of lost his footing coming around the bag, and he was stumbling and bumbling, and I watched him fall almost halfway to home and, and get all the way home safe on all fours. I've seen him slide. I watched him dislocate his shoulder, sliding into second one time. Uh, a pastor, probably in his 40s by then, who had no business sliding head first uh, into a fixed base anymore. Uh, but um, I think God appreciates when we do our dead level best, even in what could be otherwise termed a friz frivolous pursuit. Wherever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Amen? And I think that includes our playtime. I think that includes everything we do. Do our best work. Give our best to our athletic endeavors. Uh, you pick it. We, God wants to delight in seeing us do our best. And doing our best with what we've been given, it's really gratitude. You see, here it is. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you're doing, thank the Lord for it. Whatever you're doing, thank the Lord by doing your very best at it. Too often, we were this morning in men's class uh, in the end of Ephesians, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of God doing the will of God, as to Lord and not to men. It's easy to be a man pleaser, isn't it? I think even of the academic world, there was a... Uh, there was a uh, chapel message I heard at college that I wish I had heard at least 10 years earlier. The man is, is Dr. Quentin Knoyer. He was the staff surgeon for uh, Baptist Men Missions, staff doctor. He was a surgeon. He went to the University of Indiana Medical School, and he talked about how the med school was run and how his grades were done. He did not get back any work with a grade the entire semester. He got no progress report. He never had his work returned. He never knew what he had gotten on each thing. Why? Because the measurement wasn't, what do I have to do to make the teacher happy? The measurement was, what is the very best I can do? For way too long, I did just what it took to make the teacher happy. I needed to do my best as unto the Lord, amen? All of us in every pursuit should do our very best and all the time. Um, I was gobsmacked the first time a guy told me he had to go a whole semester, never got a grade. A year later, I took a class like that. I took two of them like that. My wife typed all the papers. She's got a special crown in heaven for that. Uh, it wasn't easy. The day I proposed to her, she would typed a 15-page paper on ancient history. I figured if she'd do that for me, she'd probably marry me too. It worked out for me. Um, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father woven right through that wonderful, beautiful paragraph. Um, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. By the way, if you cannot do something with thankfulness, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. It's a pretty good measurement, isn't it, for what I'm involving myself in? If I'm in the middle of something, could I stop in the middle of it and bow my head and thank God for it? Thank God for this good food. Thank Oh, I got to eat my wife's pie this week. Uh-huh. Thank God for good food. I can stop in the middle, even though you know, a little cheat in the diet, but you know the Lord knows I've been faithful there, and I had my apple pie coming. Uh, but the fact is, can we stop in the middle of what we're doing and thank God for what it is we're involved in? 
And maybe if we cannot, maybe that's not something we should be doing. We need to be thinking that way sometimes. Uh, our final strand is the thanksgiving strand of obeying God's spiritual commandments. We're commanded to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In everything, in every situation, in every hardship, in every good time and every bad, give thanks. That's God's will for us in Christ. And again, in Christ, what is my life in Christ? The very worst thing that could happen to me, I could walk out and be hit by a city bus on the Westbrook Field Road. That would be a rarity. I think my odds are pretty good. But, but the worst thing that could happen to me today is I could die. What happens to me when I die? I am in my Savior's presence. If that's the worst thing that can happen to me, that's a pretty nice place to live, is it not? And I can trust him for that. <coughs> Forgive me. It's not, um, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it means in the final analysis, I know where I'm going. I know how it ends. My Pittsburgh Steelers are stinking it up this year. And I, if I watch them, I don't watch them live. And to be honest, most every game I've watched, I've watched knowing the outcome. Uh, I didn't last week. If I had known the outcome, I would have just watched the first half and gone to bed. Uh, but you know something? When you already know they won, insert the Sox or the Celts here as well, when you already know they won, kind of takes pressure off, doesn't it? This is my life in Christ. I'm on the victory side. I'm heaven bound. God knows my name. You ever feel completely anonymous and like you don't count? I am trying to remember the last time I voted for anybody in Massachusetts who won anything. I don't think I count. I think I am an obscure little heartbeat in the middle of where. But the God of all creation, not only does he know my name, he knows how many hairs are left on my head. He knows everything I'm going through. He knows everything I'm going to go through. He knows all my faults. And he loves me through them. Oh, what a place to exist. Amen? The God of all creation loves me. His son died for me. His spirit moved in me to draw me to salvation. I believed in Jesus and I am heaven bound with my sins forgiven. I need to be thankful. <coughs> Sorry. Too much talking. I'm going to get done real quick. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we read this morning. Be anxious, verse 4. <coughs> I'm sorry, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And again, when I was a little boy, that just confused me. What's, what's Turkey and Pilgrims got to do with my prayer life? But really, it's me being thankful to God, even as I'm asking Him for the next thing, being grateful for the last thing. I come to him in prayer and with a heart of thanksgiving. And then corporate prayer um, is perhaps in view here in 1 Timothy 2. That was our call to worship. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Pray for each other. Thank the Lord for each other. Thank the Lord for each other. Thank the Lord on behalf of each other. <clears throat> on behalf of all men, verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We need to pray for our leadership at every level. Town, state, federal, county. Hey, are you praying for leadership? That's what the Lord tells us to do. For all who are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity so that we can live with a good testimony. 
that we can live in peace and tranquility, a quiet life, and that we can have the dignity that fits the office of Christian, really. Let your conversation, King James says, be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Your conversation is not just your spoken word as you and I use that. It's your manner of living. Let your manner of living be as becometh, that is, that dress becomes you, that's fitting for you, that's just the right color, it makes your eyes pop, etc. Um, our way of life should be fit the gospel of Christ. We should sound like, look like, act like, think like people for whom the precious blood of Christ was shed. People that were worthy of the blood of Christ. People that were blessed by the blood of Christ. People that were saved by the grace of God. We ought to live that in our daily life. Amen? We ought to live a life of thanksgiving. You know, you give a kid a baseball bat for his birthday. What's the ideal? Thanks for the baseball bat, but what's the ideal? A well-hit ball. Use it. Put it to work. Enjoy it. Take it for what it is. You can pick it, whatever it is in your life, uh, or, or those to whom you give, but you understand, I think, the gist of what I'm saying. We need to take everything God has given us and live a life that is for Him and live a life of thanksgiving to Him. Father, thank you for your word. Please impress it upon our hearts. May we truly, Lord, in an ungrateful world, may we be unique and different. May we be a testimony to you, a witness for you, because we are thankful, truly thankful to you, and we show it in how we live and how we think and what we do. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Christ's name. It's only on PowerPoint. It's not in your um, hymnal. But would you stand together with me as we sing the hymn, Thank You, Lord, not just the chorus, but the hymn. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. <clears throat> Some thank the Lord for friends and home, for mercy sure and sweet. But I would praise Him for His grace, in prayer I would repeat.
we need to get out of the more that we just watch over us and that we feel safe to travel at home and that we uh, bring us back to the next safe and safety together. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Worthy is the Lord.